review a little bit. Uh, the first three chapters in Ephesians, those three chapters are dominated by great doctrinal themes. Okay, in those chapters, Paul stresses the amazing grace that God has shown these Gentile Christians in and through his atoning work in Jesus Christ, and we've, we've gone through that. Chapter 3, verses 14 to 19, he tells them his prayer for them in light of what God has done for them. So he, he's been talking about the tremendous blessings, what they have in Christ. Then in three fourteen to 19, he tells them his prayer for them in light of what God has done for them, how he's blessed them. And the ultimate goal of that prayer is that they, through God's grace, might become all that God would have them be, that they might be spiritually mature. That's the bottom line of that prayer that he prays for them in 3, 14 through 19. Then he concludes that prayer with that grand doxology in chapter 3, verses 20 to 21, wherein he ascribes glory to God in the church and in Christ Jesus. And he says that that glory, that glory will shine forth forever and ever. And we talked about that last week. Now, beginning in chapter 4, there's a shift. Okay, there's a definite shift at the beginning of chapter 4 from theology to ethical admonition. And it doesn't mean it's airtight. You get ethical admonition in the first three chapters, and you get theology, doctrinal things in the, in the 4, 5, and 6. But there's a definite shift in emphasis, where in the first three chapters, he proclaims to them these great doctrinal truths. Then when we get to chapter 4, he's going to call them to how you are to live in light of those things. Because there is a consequence. We have been delivered and saved and redeemed, and that has implications for how we live. You know, I, I, this idea that we can somehow divorce uh, our confession of faith from how we live is just not biblical. It's everywhere that there are consequences to God's work in our lives. He has redeemed us, therefore we are to live to honor Him. And so he's, he's on this in chapter 4, as you'll see as we go through it, and as you already know, there's this, there's this shift, and he's really going to, to press them. And I wanted to pick back up. I talked a bit about chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. I want to read that again. I'll repeat some of what I said. You know how this works. And then, of course, if I turn this on, it works better. And there we go. And then, then I'll, we'll pick up and go on. But I do want to repeat some of what I said last week. Chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, he says, I, the prisoner in the Lord, urge you, therefore, to walk worthily of the calling to which you were called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you also were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. As I said last week, Paul urges them here to live worthily of the blessed state to which they've been called in Christ. And specifically he's saying, listen, I want you to make every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. This is central to walking worthily of the calling to which they've been called. He wants them to do that, and that involves conducting themselves with all humility and gentleness, with patience, and bearing with one another in love. Now, Christ, in the first three chapters, he has labored to make the point that Christ has effected peace between the formerly hostile Jews and Gentiles. Remember, this was one of the, the fundamental divides of the first century. One that I think we, you know, if you think Palestinians and Jews today, see, maybe that'll give you a sense of the kind of hostility and the divide that Christ has healed. Okay, so he's gone through in the first three chapters and says God has in Christ has healed these hostilities across such a fundamental divide as Jews and Gentiles. So he's made that point in the first three chapters. He put to death their hostility and he formed one new body whose various parts, though they share the same spirit, the one spirit in whom they have access to the Father, as he said in chapter 2, verses 14 through 18. Okay, so he's, he's talked to them about that. You have this one and that unity, it's a spiritual fact. He doesn't exhort them to create that unity. It has been created. He exhorts them to maintain it. Okay, it is a spiritual fact, and he tells them that they are to maintain that unity of the Spirit. They're to maintain the unity of the Spirit, the unity Christ effected in the form of the bond of peace, 
Meaning they're to express that unity by living at peace with one another. That's how they're to do it. Now, you think about if he can tell people who had, who had overcome such a fundamental divide as Jew and Gentile, if he says, you are called to live at peace with one another. Yes, I understand you're Jews and Gentiles and that you are warring with one another, and that there was this tremendous thing, and you looked down on one another, couldn't stand one another, but you're to live at peace with each other. If he can say that to groups that had been formerly so hostile, what would he say to us? What would he say to us in terms of, you're to live at peace with one another? Okay, well, I, I, even more so. If it's true of them, then certainly more so us. Right? Right? More so us. Now, the qualities that are essential to the goal of living at peace with one another, to maintaining this unity of the Spirit, include humility, gentleness, and patience. As I said last week, these these qualities, they facilitate peace. Right? Humility, gentleness, and patience, they facilitate peace, and they're part of what's necessary to bear with one another in love. And bearing with one another's weaknesses and failures out of love, that's the essence of of living at peace with one another. Bearing with one another's failures and weaknesses out of love. Okay, that's the essence of living at peace with one another. You have to do that. If you're sitting here and just carping at each other and not bearing with one another and say, okay, you know, uh, I see. We're we're, We're all broken in different ways. We're all twisted in different ways. We're all limping in different ways. And we call one another higher, but we bear with one another's weaknesses in love as we do that. Okay, you shouldn't say, well, I, I would never do that. Well, you probably wouldn't. But I bet the person can crawl in your head and say, ooh, I'd never do that. Ah, right? See, so we're all, we're all bent in different ways. But this is essential, this thing of, of, of bearing with one another's weaknesses and failures out of love. Now, you got notice that the gentleness, patience, love, and peace... Those things are all fruit of the Spirit. Okay, in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 through 23. So part of maintaining the unity of the Spirit is yielding to the Spirit's transforming work in one's life that the virtues necessary for maintaining that unity will flourish. Okay, so these things are fruit of the Spirit. So what's part of maintaining the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace? It's yielding to the Spirit that he will transform me and produce this fruit in my life, that I'm now able to contribute to that, to that maintaining of that unity. So you have kind of a a neat interplay here. Now to fail to maintain the unity of the Spirit, to live in a manner that mars that unity, is to say that Christ's sacrificial death, by which relationships have been reconciled, it's to say that that's really of no consequence to us. That is how serious... This thing is about maintaining unity and living at peace with one another. If you mar that unity, you're saying in essence that Christ's reconciling work is really not that important. And that's serious to say. Right? Yet we don't seem to get that when we have factions or groups that just, you know, generate hostility against other people. Okay? Just go out and, you know, collect up people and see if I can... Get around me people who are upset and agitated and angry and create a little pocket. This just happens in churches, right? So you have have then, you you know, that's that's my grumbling for somebody who's just complaining and carping. You see? See, then have another little pocket start over here. Right? And then you have these little subgroups. And everybody just kind of says, that's okay. I'll tell you one thing that will help stop that. When people come to you and they start bad-mouthing people, they start running people down and just, you know, hell, you know, this stuff is just terrible. You know, this guy, I don't know, this guy doesn't do this, he doesn't do that. Just say, listen, I really don't think that's good. I really don't think that's healthy for the body of Christ to talk that way. I don't see the benefit in it. Okay, well, see, when that happens, then people won't do that to you anymore. You see? And hopefully they would take it seriously and say, you know, all right, but you see how serious this is. But we tend to just, every church, I mean, this just seems to be a common thing that we just don't, we don't get how important it is. 
And so we have to be careful about that. Now, Paul here, okay, Paul, he underscores the unity of Christians that he's exhorted them to maintain. He underscores that by listing seven unifying realities of the Christian experience. That's what this one stuff is, okay? He's, he is, he's underscoring the unity. He's been saying, listen, you need to maintain this unity. So then he, he lists these seven unifying realities of the Christian experience to underscore that. That's how it functions. He's just not out of the blue just popping in and saying, you know, there's one, this, one, this. That's how it functions. It's underscoring the unity that we have in Christ. He says there's one church. There's one body of Christ, so all Christians are members of the same body. There's not one body for Jews and another for Gentiles. There's not one body for the educated and another for the uneducated. There's not one body for the highborn and one for the commoner. There's not one body for the master and another for the slave. There's one body, so you're all members of the same body. There is unity. There is oneness. He says there is one body. He says there's one spirit, so all Christians are sharers of the same spirit. There's not one spirit in which Jewish Christians share. And another spirit in which Gentile Christians share. There's not one spirit in which the rich share. And another spirit in which the poor share. There's one spirit. So we're sharers of the same spirit. There's one hope to which all Christians were called. That's the one hope that he mentioned in chapter 1 verse 18. There's not one hope for Jews and another hope for Gentiles. Okay, so you're a Jewish Christian. Here's your hope. You're a Gentile Christian, here's your hope. You're rich, poor, educated, uneducated, the whole thing. There is one hope to which Christians have been called, and as I said when discussing chapter 1, verse 18, the content of that hope is the riches of the glory of his inheritance among the saints. It's the experience of participating in the final purpose of God's saving activity in Christ, participating in the universal reconciliation of all things in Christ. Okay, that picture that he painted in verses 9 and 10 of chapter 1. All the things, all the fragmentation, all that is the curse is lifted. Everything is healed. We will share and live forever in a new heaven and a new earth, in resurrection bodies that are imperishable and immortal. Okay, so he says there's one hope that Christians share, Okay, not one for Jewish Christians, not one for Gentile Christians or for any other divisions that you have. There's one Lord Jesus Christ, so all Christians have the same object of faith. Okay, there's not one Lord in whom Jews believe, another Lord in whom Gentiles believe. Rich, poor, educated, uneducated, you get it, right? There's one. So in that one, there is unity. There's one. He says there's one faith, one gospel, so all Christians share a fundamental body of belief. There's not a gospel for Jew, another one for Gentile. There's one. There is one faith. There's one baptism, so all Christians share in the same initiation rite. All have submitted to immersion because of their faith in Christ. There's not a Jewish baptism and a Gentile baptism. There's not a rich baptism and a poor baptism. There's one baptism. So do you see all of these things? They are unifying features of Christianity. That's why he's listing them, because he's reinforcing this idea of, listen, we are one. We are one. We have these common things. Okay, he says that there's, with regard to baptism, let me quote to you what Ernest Best says. He says, the one baptism is obviously the Christian initiatory rite, of water baptism and not spirit baptism, though, of course, the two cannot be dissociated. They're tied together. But here you see this idea, there's one baptism. He says there's one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. So all Christians have been reconciled to, brought into a special relationship with the same God. Right? There's not reconciliation of Jewish Christians to one God. And reconciliation of Gentile Christians to another God. We're all children in a special sense of the one God. So he's listing these things to, to underscore the unity that is ours in Christ. And this isn't a comprehensive list of everything that's important in the Christian faith. Okay, Sometimes people parachute in on here and say, well, that's all that's important. 
Well, this isn't a comprehensive list of everything that's important in the Christian faith, as the absence of the Lord's Supper ought to tell you. Okay, that's not what this is. He's using this. It's a list of singular items, one things. Okay, it's a list of one things that he gives to underscore the unity of Christians. He speaks generally about these things, and he doesn't get into the boundaries of the one hope. He doesn't get into the boundaries of the one faith, the essentials of the one baptism. I mean, Paul can understand that when somebody goes and they're preaching a different gospel, right, in Galatia, right? What's he tell them? Okay, he understands there are boundaries, but, but delineating those boundaries is not his purpose here. You know, he, he's not sitting here and say, by the way, let me go off on an excursus and try to talk about the boundaries of the one faith. That's not his purpose. His purpose is to say and let people understand that there is a body of belief that we all share. And when somebody pushes that boundary, okay, Paul will call them on it. But you have to look elsewhere to find that. You can't just simply sit here and say, okay, that's all it is. So then anytime somebody says Jesus, what? Well, they said Jesus, one faith. Okay, that's not what he's talking about. And it's easy to misunderstand that. We have to look for those answers elsewhere. Now, he pounds on the unity here. Now look what he says in 7 through 16. But to each one of us, Grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he took prisoners captive. He gave gifts to men. Now, what is the implication of he ascended, except that he also descended to the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is himself also the one who ascended far above the heavens, far above all the heavens, so that he might fill all things. And he himself gave the apostles and also the prophets and the evangelists and the shepherds and teachers for the conditioning of the saints for the work of service, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to the completed man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children being tossed by waves and blown about by every wind of teaching, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. Instead, let us, by speaking the truth in love, grow up in every way into him who is the head, that is Christ, from whom the entire body, being fitted together and united by every supporting ligament, brings about the growth of the body in accordance with the degree of activity of each individual part for the building up of itself, In love. Okay, now within the unity of the body of Christ, he's just stressed the oneness. He said, listen, there there is this oneness that Christ has affected. You are to maintain that oneness, to underscore that. He says there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. So he's really pressed on the unity in in chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Okay, well, within that unity of the body, there is a diversity of function of the individual members. There's this tremendous unity, but that doesn't mean we're all cookie cutters. We all do the same thing. There is great diversity of function within that unity. You can see that in 1 Corinthians 12, 14 to 20 also. Now, each member has been given by the ascended Christ a gift of grace in varied measure that enables him or her to perform his or her distinctive roles within the body. Okay, you're familiar with this idea that the ascended Christ has gifted the members of the body, to function in the body and to fulfill those different roles that they have. You see that elsewhere, that those gifts of grace are imparted by Christ through the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 11. So the Spirit is the immediate giver. The ultimate giver is Christ. And He ascends to heaven and He bestows these gifts on the different parts that have different functions that happen within this unity that He has stressed. So we're not all the same in that sense. Okay, we have different functions, different things to do, and this bestowal of grace on Christians upon Christ's ascension back to heaven is what's behind the statement they're familiar with. See, he says, but to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, he's telling them that's what's behind this statement you're familiar with. When he ascended on high, he took prisoners captive, he gave gifts to men. Now that statement that they're familiar with, it's rooted in Psalm 68, 18. Okay, under the English versification, it's Psalm 68, 18. But it differs from that psalm, which has caused a lot of discussion. 
It differs from that, verse 68, 18, most significantly in the change from he received gifts among men, which is what it says in the Masoretic text, the Hebrew, also the Septuagint, says he received gifts from among men to what he says here, that he gave gifts to men. So people say, well, what's going on here? Well, you know, why is there this difference? Is he misciting Scripture? Well, there are a number of ideas. Now, the statement, as I say, it's rooted in 68.18, but perhaps Paul is putting his inspired imprimatur on a known interpretive paraphrase of Psalm 68.18 that brought out what was latent in that verse. In other words, it drew out the meaning that's there where it says here that it, it, it speaks about you know, the victors receiving gifts among men, and that he, but he did so. What's the purpose of that? The purpose of that receiving gifts from among men is that he might share the spoils with people. Okay, so maybe Paul, this is Paul putting his stamp on an interpretive paraphrase of 6818 that was out there. And in fact, you say, well, did people read it that way? They did read it that way. There's some rabbinic evidence uh, of a, a translation that says, Thou hast ascended on high, thou hast led captivity captive, thou hast given gifts to men. Okay, so it's not strange to think that this paraphrase of the meaning here was understood, and if that's what Paul refers to, then he puts his seal of approval on it. Or maybe it's a Christian hymn. This uh, commentator guy named Muddeman thinks it's a, it's a Christian hymn they were familiar with that had already drawn out the implications of Psalm 68.18. Then another guy, Harold Honer, he thinks that, look, Paul is not quoting 68.18. He's not doing that. Instead, what he's doing, he's summarizing the entire psalm in words that track verse 18. In other words, the aspect of giving gifts to men is taken from examples throughout the psalm. Paul is summarizing the entire psalm in, in words that parallel 68.18. Okay, but whatever the particulars or the details of the reference, the picture is clear. Okay, the picture is clear of the victor returning with captives and spoils and bestowing gifts on his people. Okay, it is somebody who is gone and he's returned in triumph with spoils, victorious, has spoils, and he bestows gifts on his people. Now, this applies to Jesus as the one who ascended in victory and distributed gifts to his people. He says, but to each one, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. So he ascended as the victor, and he has bestowed gifts on his people. Here's how Honer puts it. He says, the point that Paul is trying to make is the fact that Christ, who ascended as victor, has the right to give gifts. For if Christ had been defeated... He would yet be in his grave and spiritual gifts would be useless to those whom he could not redeem. On the other hand, Christ did not receive gifts from the defeated foes, as in Psalm 68, for such would be useless to God and his children. Satan's sin and death have been defeated by Christ's redemption. Consequently, those who were held in their bondage have been freed and have obtained the gifts of the Spirit from their victorious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ." Okay, so that's what I think when Paul is saying to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gifts. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he took prisoners captive, he gave gifts to men. He's speaking of Christ's ascent in victory, and then the subsequent bestowal of the gifts that we have to function within the body of Christ. Okay, I think that's that's what he's talking about there. Now, the parenthetical statement you see in verses 9 and 10 It elaborates on this reference here in verse 8 where he says, When he ascended on high, he took prisoners captive, he gave gifts to men. And he says, now what's the implication of he ascended? Okay, in that verse or that statement that he just mentioned. Except that he also descended to the lower regions, the earth. Now some translations will take that. They will say, literally you could translate it, to the lower regions of the earth. Okay, you could translate it that way. It's a, it's a genitive, but most people, most commentators think it's a, what's called a genitive of apposition, which means it's like this. The lower regions meaning the earth. Okay, and that's how I understand it. I think it, what, he, what he's talking about here, you have this, is that it refers to Christ's great ascent from earth to heaven after the resurrection, 
which he's already mentioned in chapter 1, verse 20 to 21, that great ascent was preceded by his descent from heaven to earth at the time of his incarnation. So he comes to earth, the same one who ascended is the one who descended. The one who came incarnate has now gone back to heaven. Okay, and that's what I think he's talking about. And the focus is on Christ's ascent in the context of his giving gifts. Okay, that's the focus. His ascent in the context of his giving gifts. Now, regarding the statement that Christ ascended far above all the heavens, you think about, well, what's that mean? Is he speaking, you know, geographically? What's that mean? I think O'Brien's on track here when he says, this language parallels his exaltation and enthronement in the heavenly realms far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, chapter 1, verse 20 to 21. In the light of this similar phraseology in the following purpose clause, in order that he might fill the whole universe, which corresponds to the expression in chapter 1, verse 23, Christ fills everything in every way, all the heavens is best understood as a metaphorical reference to the powers of 121 who have been subjugated to him. In other words, when he, when he says this, okay, when he says here that he ascended far above all the heavens, I think the point here is that he was exalted above all powers. There is no power. And as I've said, this doesn't, you know, we live in a, in a world that is just soaked in materialism that we really don't think about spiritual realities. They just don't enter into us the idea of forces and powers and enemies. We don't think about that. But in this world, you have to understand how comforting that is to hear that the one you worship is over all, over all powers, over all of these things that you may fear, that you're living in this world that we would call superstitious, and I would in some ways call insightful. But see, they're living here, and he, so it, it, the power of this, we need to translate this some into our own lives. Now, the goal of the exaltation is that, it, is that he might fill all things in the sense of exercising universal sovereign rule. Okay, that's what it's about when he talks about filling all things. In Jeremiah 23, 24, when God says, Do I not fill heaven and earth? When he says that, he's saying he exercises lordship over everything. Okay, so that's this point here when he's talking about that, that he might fill all things. The idea is, is applied to Christ that he might exercise universal sovereign rule. So he has been taken, he has been exalted, he is above every power. All of these things are in subjugation to him. He is the ultimate king, the greatest authority. King of kings and Lord of lords. Okay, that's, that's who he is. Now in this, vic in, in this victory, okay, it is, it's this victorious ascended Christ. Okay, the Lord Jesus ascended and exalted. It's this victorious ascended Christ who gave the church, he gave the church the apostles and also the prophets and the evangelists and the shepherds and the teachers. Okay, he, the ascended Christ gave the church these people. He provided to the church these various ministers of the word. That's who they are. They're ministers of the word whom he gifted to serve in their respective roles. These are all men through whom the gospel is revealed, declared, and taught. Christ gave these people, these gifted people to the church, these ministers of the word, these people who present the gospel, reveal it, declare it, and teach it, he provided them to the church. Now, he lists them here. You have the apostles and prophets. Christ gave the church the apostles and prophets. They were mentioned in chapter 2, verse 20, and chapter 3, verse 5. They had a what? A foundational role as the authoritative proclaimers of the divinely revealed mystery of Christ. And their role, it certainly overlaps with some of these others who have been given to the church. But they are foundational. They had that pivotal foundational role as authoritative proclaimers of the divinely revealed mystery of Christ. God has given them that word and they have taken it out. They have laid the foundation. They have taken this word out in this message. And he speaks of evangelists who most likely that refers to those who spread this foundational message of the apostles and prophets to new territories. 
You know, there's some disagreement about how do you understand that. But it looks to me like they're the people who take this foundational message that was brought in through the apostles and prophets and they take that message to new territories. That seems to be the case with Philip in Acts chapter 8 verses 26 through 40. And Philip is called the evangelist in Acts 21 verse 8. That seems to fit with his purpose and function. And, and Eusebius, Honer cites Eusebius and he says, quote, in the early church, Eusebius is an uh, early 4th century church historian. Honer cites him and he says, in the early church it was thought that the evangelists were those who preached the gospel and were the successors to the apostles and that they laid the foundations of the faith in new areas, appointed shepherds, and then, then moved to other lands and people. Okay, you see, Timothy, for example, he's told to do the work of an evangelist in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5, while he was stationed in Ephesus. That's assuming that he's still where he was in 1 Timothy. Okay, but he's told there to do the work of the evangelist, but we're not told what that involved. Which we'd like to be, but God said you don't need to know that. At least not here spelled out for you. Okay, but one of the things of note is that Paul wants Timothy to return to him before winter... You see that in 2 Timothy 4.21. So presumably the role that Paul envisioned for him at Ephesus would be completed by that time. Okay, he says, I want you to come back to me. So you have apostles and prophets, you have evangelists, and the shepherds, of course, are leaders of local congregations. That's the shepherds are, in brief, they're responsible for the spiritual welfare of the congregation. I've got tons of verses I could spout for you, but you know that. They're responsible for, that doesn't mean you're not responsible it means that they have this responsibility before God of the spiritual maturation of this flock of people and the protection of it. And it's high duty. High duty. Serious duty. Stressful duty. And that's why we need to be grateful for the men who do this. Okay? Because we don't want to add to their burden. Okay, so I, I've said before when I've taught here, I don't get paid by the elders for doing this. So don't think I'm, you know, they're going to be sitting here saying, here, there's a little something extra for you. I'm just telling you what I think about it. Okay? Now here they, how long has it been since you've told them you appreciate what they do? This is good for people. They're working, they're bearing burdens. And it's just ungrateful not to say, listen, thanks, you guys are great. I appreciate what you're doing. And if you, you have a beef with them, you go and tell them. You go talk to them. You say, listen, I don't know what you guys are doing. Why are you doing that? What you don't do is go to other people and run them down. That's not good. That's not right. You know, they're big, they're big boys. If you want to go talk to them, you go talk to them. Say, listen, I think you're crazy. What are you doing? All right, well, then, you know, you talk to them. Tell them what you think. But you love them and respect them and encourage them when you can, really. And I just ask how long has it been since you've done that? Uh, because it's, it's important for them. But you see here, they have the spiritual welfare of the congregation. That's their charge. It is not all these other things that we typically you know, attribute to them. That they're just managers of budgets and buildings and paint colors and carpet and all of that kind of stuff. You see, it is the spiritual welfare of the congregation, they have that responsibility. They're leaders that way. And this necessarily involves them in teaching and modeling the Word of God. That's why, see, when I said that these are ministers of the Word, that's shepherds teach. You see, they teach. They are sharing with the community of faith the truths of Jesus Christ. And they model those truths in their lives. Okay, but they, they have this function... That involves them in teaching. And you know what, uh, you know that you have these terms sometimes. I'll just run through this. You have these different terms, three of them that are used that apply to them. They all refer to the same office, right? Okay, you've got these terms of presbyteros, which is translated elder. You have episkopos, translated overseer or bishop, poimain, translated shepherd or pastor. Those are just different English translations of those words. But those three Greek words... They deal with the same office. And you say, well, why do you think that? Well, there are a number of places where you can see it. In Acts 20, 17, Paul sends for the elders of the church in Ephesus, and then he reminds them in 20, 28 that they are overseers. And he commands them to shepherd 
the church of God. Okay, so you see right here, there seems to be a correlation between all of these terms. Uh, Titus 1.5, Paul tells Titus to appoint elders in every city. In 1.7, the elders are called overseers. 1 Peter 5.1, he addresses the elders. And in 5.2, he tells them to shepherd and to oversee. All right, so that's where you get this idea from, that basically they're the same office, the same function, the same role. So we have here, he says, the apostles and prophets... Okay, he's given evangelists, he's given shepherds, he's given teachers were those within the congregation who had some kind of formal responsibility for expounding or applying scripture, for explaining or reiterating apostolic teaching. Okay, people like that, who had some formal responsibility for doing that. Timothy's urged not only to pursue a teaching ministry himself, but what? Also to entrust to faithful men... Uh, and trust what he's learned to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So there is a teaching ministry. And so he says, Christ is given to the church. He's given apostles and prophets. He's given evangelists. He's given shepherds. And he's given teachers. And these ministers of the word, they function within the body as catalysts for the body's growth. That is the function of these implanted ministers of the word purveyors of divine truth, they function, see, as catalysts for the body's growth. As they deliver the nutrition of the Word of God, the other members of the body are then thereby equipped. They deliver the Word of God, and that equips the other, minister, the other members of the body to disseminate the truth of Christ throughout the body to widen and deepen the impact of that truth so as to nourish the body. See, they are the catalyst. They equip the people. They deliver the word of God to the people. That then equips them to disseminate that truth throughout the body so it goes deeper. Okay, it goes deeper into the body of Christ and therefore it nourishes the body. The ministers of the word, they condition the saints for works of service or works of ministry so that the body of Christ is built up. That's how this process works. And then you see here, this building up of the body, it's to continue through this process, ministers of the word, building up people, equipping them to disseminate the truth of Christ throughout the body, therefore uh, reverberating or deepening the impact of that word, spreading that word throughout the body, nourishing the body, and in that process, the body is built up. And this process is to continue, this building up of the body of Christ is to continue until its objective is achieved, until the church collectively arrives at its ultimate goal, which is described by three parallel clauses. The ultimate goal is described by three parallel clauses, all of which begin with the same preposition. It's to continue until we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to the completed man, and to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Okay, this process is to go on until then, until the church as a whole, the, until the church as a whole is as fully like Christ as it will be. We would say until we've finally arrived. Until the church is as fully like Christ as it will be, with all having arrived at the same complete grasp of the faith and of the Son of God, the work of building up the body continues. Okay, until that point. Now, with uh, Marcus Bart and Max Turner and Peter O'Brien and I'm sure many others, I'm convinced and I understand this as a reference to the church's completed status at Christ's return. After Christ's return turns is when we'll arrive here. Let me read what Max Turner says. Paul is not describing some future historical period when the church gradually reaches unity of beliefs and organization and becomes a mature church, as the NIV could be taken as suggesting. He anticipates, rather, the coming of Christ, which will consummate the cosmic unity inaugurated at the cross. By faith and in our knowledge of the Son, we already participate in this unity. Indeed, it's given to us to maintain, chapter 4, verse 21, but we yet wait to see it fully realized. At Christ's coming, and only then, shall we, the universal corporate church, form the perfect man, fully mature with the fullness of Christ himself, quoting the New Jerusalem Bible. Or perhaps better, 
attain to the mature manhood measured by nothing less than the full stature of Christ, which is how it's put in the Revised English Bible. Okay, I'm with those guys thinking that that's what he's referring to. And the fact that the work of building up the body will continue until its finalization at Christ's return, it need not mean that apostles and prophets will always be given to the church. That's part of why we don't like that idea. But it need not mean that. See, their role was foundational. Their role was foundational, and its effect continues through the truths that have been revealed in the New Testament. So I can believe that this is the consummation and not believe that we have to have apostles and prophets today, because I don't believe that. Okay, but I just want you to see that. Now, the purpose of the building up of the body of Christ, that's to continue until the church's arrival at its complete ultimate maturity. What's the purpose of that? It's that the church may progress toward that end. Okay, we are ultimately going to be there at Christ's return, but the purpose of this building up is to progress toward that end that we may increasingly, increasingly grow out of the immaturity that makes the church vulnerable to theological con men. Do you see the theological emphasis here? That we're going to be, we are to grow up and be matured. We're to progress toward that end so we won't be vulnerable to these people. He says, so that we may no longer be children being tossed by waves and blown about by every wind of teaching, by by every wind of teaching, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. You see, theology and being grounded and built up, you can't stay on baby food. We have to be grounded and built up. Otherwise, you're vulnerable, you're unstable. And you have to be built up that way. Okay, I heard that bell. Thank you.